for technical hobbyists, it was a dream come true. Now they could have their own computer. Clubs of enthusiasts grew up all over America, like the Homebrew Computer Club in San Francisco, where members showed off what they'd got their homebrewed computers to do. From these modest beginnings came a series of startup companies selling parts for the Altair, and soon whole computers. By 1976, there were enough of them to hold a convention in Atlantic City. Off in a corner of the convention hall were a group of scruffy-looking individuals selling circuit boards. Two of them would become synonymous with the personal computer, Steve Jobs and Stephen Wozniak. As teenagers growing up in Silicon Valley, Jobs and Wozniak had developed reputations as high-tech pranksters, all too eager to thumb their noses at authority. Woz and I had known each other since I was about 12 or 13 years old. And our first project together was we built these little blue boxes to uh, make free telephone calls. And we had the best blue box in the world. It was this all digital little blue box. I don't think it works anymore, so. Uh, but uh, we, had a, we had a fun time doing that. So when it came to building a computer together, Woz was the brilliant hardware engineer and focused on the core design of the computer. And uh, I was worrying about which parts we ought to use and how we were going to build these things and how a, sort of a, somebody that wasn't a WAS was going to manage to buy all the extra parts you still needed to buy and plug this thing together. So I was, I was not designing a computer with any idea we'd ever start a company, ever have a product, ever be successful. It was just to go down to the club and show off and to own and use. Steve saw the interest and he started coming up with ideas right away how this thing could be turned into product how it could be marketed. The two Steves, however, knew little about running a business. Their ambitions might have come to nothing had they not decided to go to Mike Markler and ask for help. Markler was a retired Intel executive who liked helping young entrepreneurs. When he saw the computer they were building, the Apple, he was entranced. And I looked at it and I said, this is the first affordable, useful, computer for people uh, and the two guys really didn't have the background and experience to to start a company and, and make it successful so I agreed to help them what happened next is the stuff of legend the story of Jobs and Wozniak and the rise of Apple computers is the American dream writ large. For the seeds the hobbyists had planted grew quickly into a huge microcomputer industry. Contrary to the expectations of the corporate establishment, people did apparently want to own their own computers, although it wasn't clear exactly why they wanted them. Some used them for games, and later scientific and business uses were found. But whatever the reason, people seemed to want to own them. While many of the startup companies folded in this turbulent market, under Markler's careful management, Apple prospered, becoming the fastest growing company in history. Jobs, Wozniak, and Markler became rich beyond their dreams. Each ended up with more than $100 million. The computer, once an expensive, room-sized machine, was now coming off the assembly line by the thousand. An idea which a decade before would have sounded like science fiction. Good evening. I'd like to welcome you all to the Hobby Computer Club. I notice there are a number of faces here that we haven't seen before. Britain, too, had its hobbyists from every walk of life, all passionate about computers. The potential of the market appealed to one of Britain's more unconventional inventors. Well, it was a new market which was dominated by the Americans and where clearly, if the cost could be reduced substantially, the, the market could be expanded. Clive Sinclair was well known for a succession of cheap, miniaturized electronic gadgets, from tiny televisions to pocket calculators. 
1980, Sinclair launched his first computer. It could be bought for £100, less if purchased as a kit, and it plugged in to any television. Programs were sold on cassettes, playable by a cheap cassette recorder. Sinclair's computers took over most of the British market. And for a short time, even in America, he was selling more machines than the three market leaders put together. They turned up everywhere. There's a large number of people applying them in all sorts of ways that are unsuspected. I got into a London taxi the other day, had one of our computers built in, and he could, you gave him any destination, he could tap it in and tell you what the cost would be. All the time that newcomers like Sinclair and Apple had been building the new personal computer industry, IBM, the industry giant, had been sitting on the sidelines watching. At first they weren't sure how to respond to this strange new market. And when they did make a half-hearted attempt to enter the field, they failed. IBM put out a personal computer in 1975. People don't know this because they don't talk about it very much. The 5100. They called it the portable computer. It weighed 30 pounds. It was big as a bread box, had a five-inch screen. It could cost $5,000 just to open the box and 9000 if you wanted it to really do anything. They were selling this at the second West Coast Computer Fair, all dressed up in nice little IBM suits, and they weren't doing much business. The guy next door to them, who had a propeller beanie on, a uh, total freak named Lyle Morrow, was doing land office business selling his disks of What's It software, as it was called, a little database program. And perhaps they learned something from that. Today, a new IBM computer has reached a personal scale. A person can afford it. A person can put it anywhere. Office. In 1981, IBM saw the light and introduced a serious personal computer. Soon they dominated the market that others had created. Despite the astonishing growth of the microcomputer industry, there were problems. Computers were now small and affordable, but they were still infuriatingly difficult to use. If you can't get a computer to do anything but frustrate you, If you're having a hard time understanding computers... What the PC revolution needed had been invented a decade before at Xerox Park. Software which made a computer easy enough for a child to use. Xerox had failed to commercialize its great discoveries it would be up to someone else to deliver the park vision to the world. That person was Steve Jobs. One day in 1979, he visited the laboratories at Park and he was astonished at what he saw. And it was just instantly obvious to anyone that this was the way things should be. Um, and so I remember coming back to Apple thinking, our, our future has just changed. This is where we have to go. The vision of Xerox Park now became Steve Jobs' vision as well. His challenge was to build a computer which was not only cheap and small, but so intuitive a child could use it. Such a computer might not only change the course of computing, but prevent the mighty IBM from dominating the PC industry. The launch date for his new product, the Macintosh, was January 1984. And in an impassioned speech to his salesman, Jobs couldn't resist invoking the name of George Orwell. It is now 1984. It appears IBM wants it all. <laughs> IBM wants it all and is aiming its guns on its last obstacle to industry control, Apple. Will Big Blue dominate the entire computer industry? The entire information age? Was George Orwell right? about 1984.